I want to talk about giving. I knew I would get a few fewer amens than normal on that point. Uh, there is a blessing in giving. Somebody say the blessing of giving. And I want to take, I mean, the Bible, all through the Bible, is a ton of verses about giving. And what I want to look at today is just a section, one little section in Exodus that talks about um, one um, scenario about giving. Now, um, look at your neighbor and say, we ain't broke. We ain't hurting on no money. Yeah. So I don't want people to think I'm teaching this because we hurting. We ain't hurting. If you, can't, if you came to the church business meeting, you would know that. But it is a principle of truth that, um, um, that when you get a hold of it and you apply it to your life, um, there are rewards to it. Amen. Uh, amen. Some people give, but they don't give with the right attitude. I believe, uh, let me just say this up front. I'm going to say this up front, but I'll probably repeat it again later. There's some things you give to God that you're obligated to give to God, whether you want to do it or not. Your tithes is one of those things. That's, that's holy. It belongs to God. But an offering, which is above and beyond your tithe, it matters how you give that. I believe God's heart is that if you're going to have an attitude about giving an offering, keep it to yourself. Amen, Pastor. Amen. All right. Okay. Let me go ahead because it's, it's, uh, it's a tension-filled robe in here today. I want you to go to Exodus chapter... Um, uh, let's see. Where do I want to start? Let's go to chapter 25. And in chapter 25, the first thing we're going to note is that the people needed a tabernacle. They needed a tabernacle. Now, this is back in the, back in the day after they were free from slavery. They had gotten free from bondage. And now they're out in the middle of the wilderness, and they need a, t they need a place to worship God. And in, verse t in chapter 25... Um, here's what it says here's what God is saying and the Lord was speaking to Moses and said to them in verse number 8 are y'all with me right there 25 verse 8 yes, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them God said I, I want them to make me a tabernacle so that um, I can dwell among them and be in the midst of them uh, God wanted to be in the midst of them and he, he manifested himself to them through and in the tabernacle it was it was a dwelling place, God's place of dwelling. Um, now, what God has done for us that's different from the Old Testament saints, when God hung out with them, when God hung out with the Israelites back then, he dwelled in the, tip, in the tabernacle. Today, he doesn't hang out in the tabernacle, he hangs out in you. Yes, Isn't that great news? Back then, they had to go to the temple. They had to go to the tabernacle to get in the presence of God. But we have the glorious, we have the glorious experience of when you meet the Lord Jesus and he's in your life, he comes and lives inside of you. Oh, that's wonderful. That makes me want to shout and praise the Lord. But back then, they needed... But now, what's the application here? The application here, I want to talk about the fact they needed a place for God to dwell. Uh, so they needed a tabernacle. We don't need a... We don't, we don't need a uh, a tabernacle for God to dwell. We have a place for God to dwell. But we do have needs. So even though they needed a tabernacle, the principle of giving here will be beneficial to you because you have needs. If I went and talked to everybody in here, everybody here in here got something that they want God to do for them. Some prayer that they want answered, something they want God to bring deliverance for, something, some door they want God to open, some prayer they want answered. Who in here got a prayer thing they want God to answer? Let me see what you look like. Good. That's everybody. That's everybody. Tell your neighbor. That's everybody. That's everybody. 
All right, so they, uh, let's see, okay, so God, they, 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 uh, God said he wanted them to build a tabernacle that would be their dwelling place. And then he says in chapter 29 and verse 42, let's go to that, chapter 29 and verse 42, he says, this shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generation at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord where I will meet you to speak with you. Do y'all need help right there? Do you need some help? They don't know when her, her phone well, started so, talking to her, y'all. It what happened. started reading this scripture to me. I was following the scriptures, and I must have hit something. And it started reading the scripture, and I didn't know how to turn it off. What did I do? Why don't we select a version of the Bible where it won't read to you? Let's do that. Okay. I'll Talk among yourselves. I'm, so, for just I'm sorry. I don't know how I did that. I'll figure it out. Uh, chestnuts roasting. Uh, why is that not doing that? Let's see what we can do here. No, it's I got the version that reads along with you, so I just have to turn it off, and I couldn't figure out. It's okay, babe. I'll Ooh. figure it out. Is that the only Bible that you have? Mm -hmm. okay. That's the only one that I use, oh, the U version okay. one, but I'll well, figure it out. Okay, all right. <laughs> don't, don't ever say that your husband will not interrupt what he's doing <laughs> to serve and teach you. Where was I? Okay, so, 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 so there at this temple, here's why it was important to him. God dwelled there. Number two, uh, God would meet and speak with them there. That's profound. God would communicate with them. They needed a place where God can communicate. There's the great news. God communicates with us right where we are, no matter where you are, no matter what your environment, no matter where you live, no matter what your position. You don't have to face in a certain direction. You don't have to be in a certain position. God will talk to you while you're driving your car. God will talk to you while your boss is cussing you out. Somebody ought to give God the shout right there. Amen. He'll, he'll communicate with you right where you are and speak with you. But that's, this was their need. That's the point I'm trying to point out. This is what they needed. They had a need and you have a need. And maybe these things are not your need, but this is what their need was. And then here's something that is profound. I love verse 44 of chapter 29 says this. So I will consecrate the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. I will also consecrate both Aaron and his sons to minister to me as priests. Oh, y'all missed a great spot to shout. Here's an amazing thought. The scripture says, God says, I'm going to consecrate them so that they will minister to me. That's what God said. Yeah. Do you not know that you can minister to God? Y'all ought to say, y'all ought to, you can bless the Lord. You can honor him. You can, you can help him. You can put a smile on his face. You can strengthen him. You, we can minister to God. I think that's amazing that God gives us the opportunity to do that. I feel and I sense that when the devil tries to get you to curse God, like the devil tried to get Job to do it by creating all the drama and all of the stuff, and yet, God, yet Job still gave God the worship and still God gave God the praise. And even though he had lost his children, lost his wealth, he got sick from the top of his head to the sole of his feet, had his jacked up friends come by and tell him that he must have been a sinning somehow, and yet he had not been sinning. He had all that drama happening in his life, but he said... The Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He still worshiped God even in the midst of the drama of what he was going through. I believe God is blessed when you worship him even with the hell that you're going through in life. 
I believe he gets blessed. I believe he gets ministered to. I believe he gets strengthened. I believe that when God can put his trust and confidence in knowing that you will plead his case and worship him, regardless of your circumstances, I believe God gets the glory and the honor. Somebody ought to say amen right there. I love that verse. He says that his sons, he says, I'm going to consecrate Aaron and his sons to minister to me. God empowers us to be able to do that. Now, here's what their need was. That's what their need was. Somebody say, that's what their need was. That's what they, need was. they had that need. What do you do when you have a need? Here's what they did. They gave willingly. Amen. They didn't say a word, but it's all right. Um, here's the point I want you to see here uh, when we read this. Is, is not that they, not just that they gave, they did give. Giving is something that should be a regular part of our lifestyle. We have to be givers. Amen. God has trouble dealing with stingy people. Amen. It is hard to receive when you are a tight wad. Somebody on your row is a tight wad. Go ahead. Point to them. <laughs> They not only gave, but the scripture says, here's the key word I want you to see. I want you to see, uh, I guess I should have probably given y'all this at the end. I'm a, when we get to the end of this story, what we're going to discover is that the glory of God filled them and filled the tabernacle. So much so, Moses couldn't even go in. He couldn't even go in the temple. The glory of God was so awesome and so mighty that he, they didn't even go in the temple. Church was so high, they didn't even get to go into church to have church. They had church outside the church. Y'all not hear what I'm saying to you. The that's what you want. Don't you want the glory of God to just be so mighty that wherever you are, there's the glory of God. Fighting the battles, opening the doors. And the thing that is a common point with all of these, I'm going to see this, we're going to see this as we read through here. The number of times it says that they gave willingly. That's what I want you to see. It is the attitude with which you do it. Right. So in, in, uh, uh, here, look at these verses right here. Verses 4 and 5 of chapter 35. It says, And Moses spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take from among you an offering to the Lord. Whoever is of what? A willing heart. Let him bring it as an offering to the Lord. Gold, silver, and bronze. And it goes on through purple, blue, scarlet, thread, fine linen, ghost hair, ram skin, dyed red, badger skin, acacia wood. Uh, here's the thing about this um, that's amazing to me. Let, me. let me stick a pin. I think I'm, I don't know if I've ever mentioned this to y'all before. I think I have. Sometimes when we do our joint revival and do revivals with other uh, services and we go to other churches and we see churches and our people get a little frustrated because their pastor won't ask people for a specific amount. But other pastors will say, give 20, give 100, give 500, give 1,000. And the First Baptist Church of People st start sending me letters and texts and emails. <clears throat> Moses said, bring gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple. That's 1,000, 2,000, 500. Somebody, but, and here's the deal. If you ain't got 1,000 and they ask for 1,000, they ain't talking to you. Don't send me no emails about that no more, y'all. If you ain't got it, they ain't talking to you. Pray to God to get you to the point where you have to make a decision about it. <laughs> Moses gave a whole string of things that he told them to bring. But he said the key is that you do it willingly. If you have an attitude, you cancel out what you want, to, what you want God to do for you. Because it, it, God's looking for people with a willing heart. Thank that section right back there with that rousing amen. 
Slide down to verse 21 of this same chapter. Then everyone came whose heart was stirred and everyone whose spirit was willing. And they brought the Lord's offering for the work of the tabernacle of meeting for all its service and for the holy garments. They came, both men and women, as many as had a, there it is again, a willing heart and brought earrings and nose rings. I don't want none of that. I'll take I definitely don't want nothing that came out your nose. <laughs> Rings and necklaces, all jewelry of gold, that is, every man who made an offering of gold to the Lord. Slide down to verse 29. The children of Israel, verse 29, brought a free will offering to the Lord. All the men and women whose hearts were willing to bring materials of all kinds of work which the Lord by the hand of Moses had commanded to be done. This is, this is powerful and it's important that you have the right attitude. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. I'm going to slide over to 2 Corinthians. We're going to come back to Exodus in a few moments but just keep your marker there but slide over to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, many of y'all probably know this verse already. Verse 7. So let each one has he purposes in his heart. So let each one give has he purposes in, in his heart. Here's how not to give. Not grudgingly or of necessity for God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Laughing. It means hilarious in the Greek. You're rolling on the floor. You're on the floor, balled up, laughing. You, you can't wait to do it. It is a joyfulness. It's a delight. God loves a cheerful giver. God is excited about a person. And, and while I'm here, since I'm here, we might as well read verse 6. It says, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. If you're a stingy giver, then what you get back will be stingy. You'll be limited. But if you're a cheerful giver, God loves it. If you're a bountiful giver, if you give abundantly, God will give abundantly back to you. Here's the principle. God gives to you in proportion to what you give to him. Amen. We live in a culture that don't like that. We live in a culture that wants to put a dollar down and get a million dollars. They want to put two dollars down and get a million dollars back. That's unnatural. That's not, um, it's not, that's not how the way it works. Um, and, if, and if you do put down a dollar and win a dollar, it was the lottery. Come on, look at your neighbor, it was the lottery. <laughs> And the problem with the lottery is sorrow comes along with it. Drama comes along with it. Pain comes along with it. Hell comes along with it. The devil comes along with it. But God loves a cheerful giver, that person who gives with a cheerful heart. And then I like verse 8 while we're here. Can I read verse 8 while I'm here? And God is able. I, this is one of my favorite verses right here. I, I don't have a favorite verse, but if I did, this is one of them right here. And God is able. We can just stop right there that we serve a God who's able. Amen. Able to make all grace abound towards you. I love that. God will make, give you all the grace you need. He will make all grace abound toward you. That you, you. always having all sufficiency in all things. That you'll have everything you need in every arena that you need, in every capacity that you need. You'll have all grace abounding towards you in all things and may have an abundance for every good work. See, not, only, not only that, he says, but you'll have an abundance. And that's what, I, that's what I like talking about is God will give you abundance. God will give you more than you need so that you'll have enough for you and somebody else. Some of you are tightwad. Some of you will never 
move to a place of prosperity because you're tight and stingy. And that's the wrong attitude to have. Let me roll on. Let me roll back. Let me go back. Let's go back to Exodus 35. Now, now here's the other point I want to make. This is another point I want to make. I think I, I'm behind on these scriptures here. I, God loves a cheerful giver. I gave that. Y'all got that right. They gave while they were in the wilderness. They gave while they were, were in the middle of nowhere. While they were out in the middle of nowhere, no banks, no jobs, no savings account, no checking accounts, no CDs, no bonuses, they were in the wilderness. And yet, even in the wilderness, they gave. And that's something I need you to, I need you to ponder that because some of you don't give because you say you can't afford to give. This is a principle to help you with your life. I want to repeat again because maybe somebody came in late. I'm not teaching this because we're in need. This is not a, this is not a teaching uh, because we have a necessity. Because we pressed up our back against the wall and we need some money to pay something. No, nope. we're doing fine. Look at your neighbor and say, we're doing fine. I'm glad to be a part of a church where we got the money managed properly and we're doing fine. Our church gives. You can talk about a lot. I'm telling you, I've, I've been in church all my life, most of my life. I've been in church most of my life. Very, I know very few churches. Matter of fact, I don't really know any church personally that gives on the level that the First Baptist Church gives. To others. I don't know any church. I'm not saying other churches don't give, but I don't know any other church that gives to the tune of, of how we give. And I'm proud of our church for that way. Um, when we, um, a few years ago, um, we, 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 we had a passion to help the poorest of the world, and we took $500,000 and sent it to an organization called Campus Compassion International to give to children around the hungry children around the world and at the same time, at the same time. we gave another five hundred thousand dollars to world vision we gave a million dollars and you know and that's on top of that's on top of the ten percent of what we bring in that we give out already that's on top of that so it was an offering and both World Vision and Compassion International both said no church in the history of either organization, no church in America had ever done anything like that in their history. And where did it come from? Some black people in Glen Arden. Come on, look at your name. You would have think it was a rich white church somewhere in Texas or California, but no. There's some black people in Glen Arden. Because we know the secret. We know how it works. We, and we're not stingy. Somebody say, we are not stingy. And right now, we are, we are doing the work we're doing in Peru. We're giving a million dollars. We're in a 10-year program to serve the needs of hungry people in Peru, to the, the, the poor people in Peru who wouldn't hear the gospel, who live in destitute situations. Every year, every year, we've committed a million dollars for 10 years to help the hungry people above and beyond our normal stuff. And you know what I know? I know that because we are givers, God will keep on showering us with blessings beyond what we dreamed or imagined. And all I'm trying to do is tell y'all this. This is what I was talking about on Sunday. All I'm trying to tell you is what hits the house will drip down on you. Somebody tell your neighbor, drip, drip, bam, bam. Drip, drip, bam. Drip, drip, bam. Do y'all hear what I'm saying to you? 
but you got to have the same attitude we have. You can't just join the church and still be stingy. You got to pick up the same attitude and the same spirit and the same commitment that we have. If you want the same anointing, you got to have the same attitude. And these people gave while they were out in the middle of nowhere. A wise farmer knows that when he harvests his crop, let me spend a few minutes on this. A wise farmer knows that when he harvests his crop, if he's wise, he knows he cannot consume every seed of what he's just harvested. He knows that of what he just harvested, he, he, he must put aside some to, to plant and sow for the next harvest. And you know what a lot of people are doing? They are spending every dollar that they take in, that they earn, every dollar. They're not sowing anything. They're not giving anything. They're not, definitely not tithing. And if they do tithe, they tithe down to the penny, $37.27. <laughs> that amazes me that you're so stingy with, with God. <laughs> you, you understand what I'm saying? With, I mean, if you believe in God and you're going to tithe, my God, don't be stingy with God. <laughs> Why would you do that? Down to the penny. You look like, ain't God worth the extra... The additional at least 73 cents to round it off up to $38. They were in the wilderness. They had no jobs. They had no bank accounts. They had no certainty of their future. But they still gave. And if you're wise, you'll be like a farmer and recognize I must sow. Do what I have to do to sow. Don't consume, look at your neighbor and say, don't consume every penny on yourself. Don't, don't consume and, and obligate yourself and everything you got coming in is going out. And you don't have room to sow. That's a problem. Let's go to chapter 36. Verse 6 and 7. Can I read that to you real quick? I'm almost finished. Verse 6. So Moses gave a commandment. And they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp. Saying. Let neither man nor woman do any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. And the people were restrained from bringing for the material they had was sufficient for all the work to be done indeed too much Moses said don't bring no more money we got more than we need look at your neighbor you'll never see that in America go ahead tell them <laughs> but isn't that an amazing thing that here they are in the middle of the wilderness in the middle of nowhere with no jobs, no bank, to take a loan, no nothing. And yet the people came and gave. And it reached a point where Moses had to say, don't bring no more. The people had to be restrained from giving. They gave more than what was needed. No woman, no man can bring anything else. And let me close with this final passage right here. Let's go to Exodus 40. Now they done bought all of this material, given all this, this stuff, bought all these offerings, and they had the resources to build the temple, and now they've completed the temple, and they, the tabernacle, I'm calling it a temple, but it's a tabernacle. It's all completed, it's all done. And in verse 36, I'm sorry, verse 34 of chapter 40. Did I tell y'all chapter 40? Verse 34. 
Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Can you imagine what life would be like if God could do that with a building? What kind of glory he could fill up in you? Amen. Matter of fact, he wants to do that in us. He wants to fill us with his glory. And, 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 and I, I'm, I'm telling you, God takes pride and joy and delight in showing his glory through people's lives. Amen. Where he's opening up doors that only he could have opened. When he answers prayers and you know that nobody could have done it but God. He takes pride in that. That's his... That's his delight. He loves that. God loves that. He gets the glory. He loves to sit to pour out his glory upon your life that other folk have to say, now how you get that? How that, how that happen for you? Why you get the promotion? Ain't nobody else got the promotion. How you get the job and you ain't qualified for the job? How you get to work there and you ain't got the education? How you, how you get the house and you don't even make enough money to earn that, make it in that house? How? How, how, how? God wants that to be the thing that people look at you and they ask the question of how and you be able to say, it's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that I serve. Him. It is because we've taken the principles of God and applied them to our life. Here, here's what I tell people all the time and I believe this and I'll take questions. If you got any questions, come on, I'm done. Y'all know I fly a plane. I'm, I'm a pilot. I love to fly. I learned about the... the the elements and components of flight, which is lift, thrust, weight, and drag. The lift is greater than the weight, and the thrust is greater than the drag. The plane to fly every time. You got wings, you got a propeller, you got gas in the tank. If everything is in order, if the lift is greater than the weight and the thrust is greater than the drag, the plane will fly every time. I've been flying since 2001. I started taking lessons. Got my license in 02, my instrument rating in 03. I've got 1,600 hours of flying time, not one time have I ever gone down the runway and put, applied the power and went down the runway and when I got to the right speed, pulled back on the yoke. Not one time have I pulled back on the yoke and the plane not taken off. Every time, every time. Because the principles of aerodynamics are in place. And I'm, here's what I'm trying to tell you. The laws of God's favor on your life are in place if you just take the principles and apply them. Now, I, I do need to say that, that, that there are some, there's some times when you are taking a risk and it's dangerous. So, so there's a lot of stuff you got to do before you take off. So I got to, I got to, um, I have to do a weight and balance check. I have to make sure that, that, that the plane is not too heavy. Right. Yeah. What's the girl, the singer name? She got killed over in the Bahamas. Yeah. Aaliyah. Her plane was too heavy. Yeah. It was too much weight on it. Your plane won't take off if you got the weight of sin, too much weight of sin on your life. Yeah. I'm feeling something over in this Amen. section right here. Yeah. Amen. But if everything else is in place, it'll take off every time. So it's just a matter of getting. And one of the things I'm trying to tell you is one of those principles is being a cheerful giver, a, a person who willingly, somebody say willingly, with the right attitude and the right spirit, willingly gives. Amen. I ain't never been finished before 8 o'clock in my life. All right, do we have any questions? Y'all ain't got no questions? Okay. Well, I know what it is. Y'all want to give an offering, don't y'all? <laughs> really 
anybody want to get saved? Anybody want to join the First Baptist Church of Bernard? Anybody want to rededicate? If that's you, get on up. Come on down here. And we'll get that straight right quick right now. Anybody fall in that category? Anybody? All right. Nobody. Let's pray over this offering. We're going to go ahead and do the offering now. Give us an opportunity to put in practice what we've been talking about. Let's pray. Father, give us a cheerful and a willing heart. Forgive us for the times that we've reluctantly did it. Forgive us for the times that we let the basket fall, pass right in front of us because we didn't want to. Or because we felt that we didn't have it to. Forgive us. God, we recognize that even as you've taught us in your word, if the children of Israel could give of their resources while they were in the wilderness, we can do it while we're in our wilderness. Father, make us know that the only way we'll get out of our wilderness is by giving. I pray that you would just bless every cheerful, willing giver today. In Jesus' name, amen.